Have you ever wondered why economists don't always agree? Welcome to the second video in the series of mine that I'm going to help you think like an economist. In this video, I'm going to be talking to you about why economists often differ. In many cases, differ quite substantially. I'm going to give you five reasons why I think this is the case. So let's get straight into it. I think it's important to understand that at the outset, whatever I provide you are merely tools that you must use to better understand the world around you. And times change, so by no means are they static. And what we mean by them we even change over time. So let's get into the first reason why economists often differ so much in their predictions or forecasts. And that is the way that people react or behave. Make no mistake, we are living in extremely uncertain times. And the way that we behave as human beings, as society, as communities, in a post-COVID world, I'm sure you'll all agree with me that the way we behave now, in many regards, is substantially different to how we behaved in 2018, 2019. One just has to think as to how we use technology in our daily lives, how it's become so increasingly pervasive in what we do and how we do it, in how we work, in how we study, in how we interact with each other. It really has changed our lives in remarkable ways. So it's becoming increasingly more difficult to predict how people react. Traditionally, economists base their predictions on past behavior. And one of the most commonly used assumptions is that we assume that people act rationally. But one of the things we learned after the global financial crisis of 2007-8 was that this is not necessarily the case. And there are many other examples of former crises that we can use to illustrate this fact, that people don't always behave rationally. Needless to say, the underlying assumption is that economists regard incentives as the main reason that drives behavior. So if you look at an example of two people, we might use two different incentives for each respective person, but the outcome of their behavior might be similar. And when we aggregate this to the macroeconomic context, it becomes even more complex because now we are making assumptions of the behavior of the group as opposed to individuals or households or entities within that group. The challenge comes when we need to make predictions or forecasts in the macroeconomic context. We're not quite sure which subgroup in that macroeconomic group acts more dominantly than say another group. So in a macroeconomic context, we make a lot of assumptions of the group that does not necessarily apply to the subgroups. Hey, now you're just making assumptions. Whether it be households, investors, exporters, importers, firms, whatever the case might be. So when economists have to forecast and we rely solely on what we believe the reaction of people will be, it's very easy to bear differing views on this. Do you look at historical data? Which historical data? What historical data? How long in the past do you look? Do you look at certain dominant groups? How do you make assumptions of the group based on the behavior of subgroups? So it really is easy to understand how economists can differ if we look at the behavior of people. Because at the end of the day, assumptions are made and these assumptions invariably lead to the differing views of economists. The second important reason is the fallibility or frailty associated with forecasting. Now, keeping in mind the issues I raised with regards to the behavior of economic agents, I mentioned, for example, the challenges of how far we need to look back in terms of the data. So if we look back at the data and we plot, for example, how people behave, how certain groups behave, does this mean that people or these groups or similar groups or similar people will behave the same in the future? Is it a mechanical process? No, by no means is it a mechanical process. The very notion of trying to predict something is in many ways nonsensical. And especially the further in the future we want to predict. I can, for example, predict what will happen in the next hour or two in my life. And I might even be quite accurate if I predict what will happen tomorrow. But as I go more and more into the future, next week, the week after next, next month, it becomes increasingly more difficult to forecast. And if you keep in mind that the economy is dynamic and changes the entire time, especially in a more globalized world, then the very notion of making forecasts is extremely complex. But fortunately or unfortunately, forecasting is one of the primary roles that is expected from the economist. So that is often why you get a situation where you'll have 
two economists that have totally diverging views in terms of the direction that they think the economy is moving in. All these factors play into it. So what I would rather say is that economists typically agree as to the general direction that the economy might be moving or the general direction in which an economic indicator moves, but the extent and the magnitude of that change would differ substantially. So by way of an example, economists might all agree that an economy might grow in the next financial year with regards to how much they expect it to grow or forecast to grow. The difference comes in there. And if you break it down even more, you'll often find that they disagree with regards to what drives the growth, which sectors drive the growth, which sectors are more dominant in the growth, which sectors are less dominant in the growth. The third reason relates to the models economists use. This is always an interesting topic when economists sit around a table because economist A might think that this particular variable is more dominant in decision making, whereas economist B believes another economic variable is more dominant. And as economists use statistical models and apply economic theory to these statistical models, we refer to this as the subject or the field of econometrics. It has, as a science, exploded in the last 15 to 20 years. In fact, as an economist, you cannot afford not to be skilled in mathematics and statistics and to be able to apply these skills within the context of how economic agents behave. So you can think now, different economists might believe that different economic variables play into human behavior and as such play into the forecasts that they make using economic variables as the basis for these forecasts. But if you make it even simpler, you might have two economists that have identical models that they build statistically. They use different data. So when the output comes, the results suggest that a particular forecast is more or less dependent on different variables. What this means is you can have two economists that have identical models, but they predict differently how people behave and the extent to which they behave because they are using the different data. So it's not just a case of having similar thinking. One needs to consider it at a more granular level. What data are you using? And what effect does the data have on the results or the outputs of the statistical model? And once we have these outputs, as an economist, we need to color it in with economic theory. Because if we couldn't color it in with economic theory, what role is there for economists? Then statisticians could do our jobs for us. So the models that economists use and the variables they incorporate within these models and the data and the time frame of the data and the type of data plays into the differing forecasts that economists may have. The fourth reason why economists often differ in their projections or predictions relates to what we refer to as lags. In other words, there might be some economic disturbance that happens at time A, but the time it takes to filter through and transmit itself through the economy is not always certain. And that comes back to the reason that I started off with in that people behave differently and we aren't guaranteed that people will behave as they did, for example, in the past. And as there's more uncertainty and times are more uncertain, it becomes increasingly more difficult to understand how people behave. Use that as a basis to forecast. So there are several different types of lags. Firstly, we observe that a certain event happens. This observational lag could take several months, even years. And then, of course, there are internal organizational lags that relate to specifically policymakers. In other words, it might take a particular committee several months to meet. And if there is a pressing issue in the economy, this wastes unnecessary time. So the bureaucracy within organizations, in particular policymakers, is a crucial part of this lag process. And one can only think in governments, bureaucracy is magnified, not to mention the politics. And then lastly, there's the external implementation lag. So once the policymakers identify or observe a particular event, they would then meet whenever they meet. There's another lag. They make a policy decision. They implement the policy decision. But then there is a lag until we see the results of that policy decision. And we don't even know if the decision will work. We don't even know if the decision will have the desired effect on the economy. So you might have a situation where there's an observation, there's a decision made in it, and there's an implementation of a policy, but nothing happens. The policy is ineffective. This might mean that you waste several years, which is why it's very important that policymakers should have their finger on the pulse. Needless to say, this is difficult because the economy changes constantly. So from a policy point of view, it's not always that easy. 
be as proactive as what we would like policymakers to. The final reason why economists differ so much in predictions or forecasts is in my view related to the interconnectivity and when we start talking about the role of technology within this context of a globalized world, we cannot ignore the uncertainty that comes with that. This obviously means that economist A might regard certain factors as more or less important than economist B, but that is similar to all the factors I've mentioned before. This issue of interconnectivity, in my view, is even more complex than that, because the reality is we don't know how interconnected we are. And what I think is important in this is the definition of uncertainty. The uncertainty associated with the extent to which we are integrated. Extremely important because there are many things we don't know that we are exposed to or know that can have an effect on us. Who would have thought in December 2019 that just a few months later, the whole world would come to a standstill because of the virus? No one believed that we would be confined to our house, in some cases for months on end. So I like referring to the notion of unknown unknowns, which means there are many things that we didn't consider that arise or influence us literally out of the blue. So if we use COVID-19 as an example, when banks assess the ability of borrowers to pay back loans before COVID-19, the idea that we could go into lockdown or that consumers might not be able to work because of, in this case, a virus, would I would argue not have been in any models used to assess the ability of customers to pay back a loan. But in a post-COVID world, because of COVID happening, it would be a very bad idea not to have something like a COVID event and the ensuing lockdowns as a very real likelihood that can affect the ability of customers to pay back their loans. So pre-COVID, banks weren't considering the effect of something like a lockdown on the ability of their customers to pay back the loan. But this is not the case post-COVID. So pre-COVID, lockdowns were an unknown unknown, whereas post-COVID, lockdowns were a known unknown. Banks now consider the likelihood of COVID happening as a possibility. They just don't know whether or not this will lead to another lockdown, but they would incorporate the likelihood or the risk attached to the possibility of going into another lockdown in their models and thus into their forecasts regarding the ability of borrowers to pay back the loans they get from banks. So in summary, it really is difficult for economists to agree 100% with their forecasts, with their predictions, with their views, because there are so many factors that play into that decision, that play into that model building, that play into those assumptions, that really one cannot expect 100% agreement. As I mentioned earlier, economists do tend to agree with the general direction that an economy might be moving in, or the general direction that an economic indicator might be moving in, but the extent and the magnitude of that change is where the main difference is coming. Of course, you might have economists that totally disagree with the magnitude and the direction of particular economic variables or the economy at large. It all depends on the assumptions, it all depends on the data, it all depends on their understanding of how economic agents behave and react to events in an economy. So that is why economists are often referred to as being professionals that are jacks of all trades. In many ways, we need to know a bit about everything. The best economists are those that understand human behavior the best. It's not only about the number crunching. It's not only about the data and the statistics and the mathematics. Great, so that brings us to the end of this video. If you enjoyed it, please click the like button and the subscribe button and ring that bell so that you can be notified for any further videos that do come along. Please consider watching the other videos in the series. They will either be on top here or down here. I will see you next time.